States. Shamanism. Uh, see, I think the reason I called my second book The Archaic Revival is because I think this is the overarching metaphor of the 20th century, that the 19th century was the gentleman's century, the white gentleman, when it all worked, commerce flourished, cities were built, the poor knew their place, uh, brown people held their position. And the 20th century has been all about confronting the, the bankruptcy of all of that. And from the time of surrealism and uh, Freud and Jung and Dada, <coughs> right through to rave music and jazz and rock and roll and abstract expressionism, these are all archaic impulses. You know, the, the 19th century is all about realism, materialism, and defined social structures. The 20th century deconstructs the visual image, deconstructs the idea of simple location. We have body piercing, we have uh, uh, trance dancing, fire walking. All of these things are impulses to return to the primitive. And what it means is that in the aura of the realization that history has failed, we're going back to an earlier model. This is what societies do when they get in trouble. You know, we forget because we're the inheritors of it, but when medieval Christianity essentially got a flat tire by having 70 popes in 25 years, none of whom died a natural death, that clued people to the idea that there was something wrong with Christian idealism. And the Renaissance capitalists, Italian city-state entrepreneurs invented classicism. Classicism, meaning a, a society based on the ideals of Greece and Rome, was a science fiction option at that point. Greece and Rome had been buried in the ground for 1,500 years, and yet they dug it up. They dug up the buildings. They dug up the manuscripts. They dug it all up, and they said, this is how people should live and we'll found classicism and we will be the patrons of the arts and we will undertake vast architectural undertakings and so forth and so on. And it worked. It set a model for society, Roman law, Greek aesthetics, clear into the middle of the 19th century when then the full consequences of the Industrial Reformation uh, created uh, you know, a kind of new surface of some sort. Now, uh, we require such a radical re, uh, a new paradigm that we have to reach outside the domain of history entirely. And the archaic then, which is a model of nomadism, of very little material culture, of uh, hedonism, a lot of focus on sexuality, sensuality, body adornment, this sort of thing, um, and an information-based culture ruled by magic. In the case of the archaic, it was natural magic. In our case, it will be the technological magic of electromagnetic uh, technology. You know, a global tribe. McLuhan was right. I mean, McLuhan is given zilch credit. He understood all of this stuff. He said all of this by 1965. The people who dismissed him never understood him. I'm quite convinced. Yeah. Well, what role do you think the, the spores and the mushrooms will play in this global atomic network? Well, I think that part of what we're on the brink of is uh, a technological innovation. But I think also a rewiring of the human organism and that uh, what psilocybin is about is it's a catalyst for language production and evolution and that uh, the future evolution of language involves language being shifted into the visual domain. Notice how, much of, how more visual reality is becoming how icon-driven 
uh, the computer interface is and stuff like this. Uh, I think that psychedelics hold the way toward a kind of telepathy, not a telepathy of you hear my thoughts, but a telepathy of I see what you mean. This would erode boundaries tremendously. I mean, it's astonishing to think that our global civilization is linked together by nothing more than small mouth noises and the electronic transduction of same. I mean, small mouth noises are a very, very crude way to communicate the kind of complexity that our, our scene requires. The great thing about psychedelics is whether these personalities are realized or, or less than realized is that you don't need them. You know, the realized ones can be your friends. But the great thing about the psychedelic enterprise is that it's democratic and self-directed. And uh, uh, actually, my experience is that if you really take high doses, it's hard to be a rat. You have to have Im incredible defenses to be a real rat and take real high doses. And what it means is sooner or later it will ambush you in some tremendously unpleasant way and then you will get straight. Uh, I think it's tremendously exciting because it's a chance to take control of, one, of the project of, one, of defining one's own authenticity. And I don't really... The, the idea of the guide... It, or I'm glad that that concept has given way to the idea of the sitter because the sitter gets it much better. What the sitter is there to do is to keep you from f rolling off the bed and to tell you that it's going to be all right, even though the sitter may have lost all confidence that it will ever <laughs> be all right. And they are guiding you nowhere because they haven't the faintest idea where you are. You know, they're just there to reassure. Uh, guided trips uh, are as often ambiguous, I think, uh, as, uh, as positive. To the, you know, I know a guy who takes mushrooms fairly often, and he always says to me, he says, each time I take it, my goal is to stand more. And what he means is that there's no bottom to it. And it will reveal literally as much as you can tolerate. And, the, you know, you can get into a lock with it where you say, show me what you really are. Show me what you really are for yourself. And instantly the cheerful scenarios of machine elves dancing mice and little candies spinning against black backgrounds. That's like suspended. And there's this organ tone, like from the Bach B minor mass, and these black velvet curtains begin to lift. And after about 15 seconds of that, you say, that's enough, thank you, <laughs> of what you really are for yourself. Because you realize it is... It, it is willing to comply with the request, but your mind can't handle it. It is coming at you through a series of veils. It is trying to be reassuring. I mean, you're saying, my God, it's an alien from the heart of the galaxy, and what it's trying to pass as is your next-door neighbor. Uh, because if it were ever to reveal the true dimensions of its alienness, you would probably vaporize in the presence of such peculiarity. Death by astonishment. We want to, we want to avoid that at all costs. Uh, yeah. Stories abound. I mean, stories upon stories. Amazing stories. And, and, and once you collect enough of them, in, you, you start collecting them thinking that there's going to be a pattern where you will learn something. Eventually you realize these stories are just designed to befuddle and lead you astray. I mean, you cannot tell what is going on. Yeah, I've considered it uh, great trip stories. Uh, <laughs>
trading with the aliens. Some of you may know a wonderful little story by Clifford Simak. I was talking to somebody about this recently. It was about a man who goes to a garage sale and he buys an oak roll top desk and in and he gets it home and he discovers that in what he just notices actually that in one corner of this desk there's what looks like an ivory dot an inlay of ivory and he then uh, has this desk and uh, after a couple of months he he finds this thing on this dot which he doesn't know what it is it's just some little thing he doesn't can't figure it out and uh, he discovers to make a long story short that if he will put something on this dot it will be traded and so he puts a paper clip and he gets a something or other and then he puts a dime and he gets something else every 24 hours and he begins trading through this alien trader uh, they, they, they are mean traders these creatures from hyperspace and the trick is to trade is to get them to trade something that's very useful to you and valueless to them uh, I grew up in western Colorado and up above nine or ten thousand feet in the old mining camps uh, there are what are called pack rats and, and what, a, what pack rats are about is they steal stuff. They steal little things, but they always leave something. They are trader rats. They don't actually steal. And there are many stories about people getting in league with a pack rat and trading seven-up bottle caps for gold nuggets that were hidden in the walls that because of these old mining towns, these rats have been stealing from the bar tills of a century ago and uh, and so this is a you know and the strange thing is when you trade with a pack rat you have to discern its psychology because it may trade seven up bottle caps for gold nuggets but if you switch to dimes it will switch to dead bees and they're no good to you so you 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 have to keep negotiating you see to get the good and to yeah yeah that's right that's right exactly although somebody pointed out to me it was another one of these torpedoes unexpected that that print is visible language that print is the condensation of sound. It's just that it requires a medium. Yeah. I was wondering, you know, in view of what you pointed out about some of the liabilities of, of asking to reveal what's deepest, darkest self, or truest being, and I'm wondering if you could share some of your thoughts about setting an agenda for a trip and entering into a dialogue with this alien, as opposed to perhaps being more passive and just la- allowing this emergence without any conscious direction to the extent that that's possible i tend to be very passive i sense immense power and potential in these states and i'm frankly afraid of it i mean i like to watch that's my bit and i have no desire to seize the levers and start pulling and pushing buttons I had a bit of a few when I was younger we messed around in more radical ways and had experiences that really I felt like threatened our sanity because you just couldn't believe what was going on Uh, I don't set agendas some people do that Uh, what I do do is I talk to it and I I ask it to to show itself and I do think you have to you you have to approach the thing. It, it is shy, or it's tasteful. It's hard to figure out which. But in any case, it will not speak to you unless spoken to. You can go through an eight-hour trip, and it will never say a word because you never said a word. And you have to say to it, "Show yourself." It doesn't hurt to verbalize it. I mean, I think of it in my mind. I sort of, I, I, I invoke it, but it's also somewhat like a seduction. I mean, you say, come out, show yourself, be beautiful. 
And then this thing, literally almost like a turmoil in the air, and they condense, and they then they do show themselves. Uh, but unless invited, they won't do that. Now, in DMT, that isn't true. They're uninvited. I mean, you're in their domain. You're in Elfland Grand Central Station, and everybody's trying to get on the train to Westport, and you're just there, you know, in the middle of this crazy situation. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I think that's really a hard thing to say. I mean, I know people who say DMT is their favorite drug, and the last time they took it was 67. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, we're not talking abuse here. Uh, I think mo- psilocybin three or four times a year is definitely means that you are a psychedelic person, for sure. It definitely means that your every waking moment is informed and transformed by your relationship to this stuff. It doesn't take very much because it's a, it's a way of thinking, you know. Uh, I admire people who can do it a lot and not go off the deep end because what I find is, you know, basically what we talk about in these workshops is what I would call the generic psychedelic experience. You know, it lasts four to eight hours. There are all kinds of crazy hallucinations, insights, tears, laughter, self-affirmation, then it goes away. That's the generic psychedelic trip. But if you start pushing, then you get to be Columbus. You know, if you, for instance, take psilocybin every 72 hours for 10 days, you will cure in the marketplace. You will preach to the masses. Uh, You will become so convinced of dogmas and points of view so peculiar that it will hand your friends a crisis. I mean, I've been there. And so it's the trick is to understand when you need to chill uh, because uh, it just starts opening ahead of you. Like when we would take it in the Amazon, uh, one of the things that we noted and talked about and was actually a moment of concern was in every psilocybin trip in the Amazon, there would come this this moment where, where you would realize that the jungle was friendly and that that's where you belonged. And there was this impulse to just take your clothes off and walk into it. And with perfect confidence, I could survive. It would take care of me. It is not threatening. It is not unfriendly. It loves me. I don't know whether that's true. I don't know what would happen to you when you came down. I mean, there are stories of people not on psilocybin who walked into the jungle and, you know, were mad from fly bites 12 hours later and basically had to be shot like dogs in the best Colombian fashion. Uh, so, you know, this is, an, so this is a very intense perception that you just don't know what to make of. Is it true? Could one somehow sustained by psychedelics, walk into that and survive or, or not. Yeah. Uh, there's people, I think, that do that without psychedelics. Like some of these people that are asking the Aboriginal skills trips, they do that to read it. You mean white people who have... But they've trained themselves. They've hardened their bodies and they've learned how to make fire and how to get water from plants. And to do it just on the spur of the moment, I don't know how long you'd last out there. Yeah, sure. Would you say something to compare LSD and mushrooms, like the psilocybin? Well, psilocybin is much more visual. Uh, LSD is more psychoanalytical, therapeutic, personal in some way. Uh, It may be more uh, efficient at personality work, you know, reconstruction and overcoming trauma or phobia or something like that. Psilocybin is largely visual and uh, spectacularly so. That's what distinguishes the tryptamine hallucinogens. 
is the ease with which they elicit really beautiful and complex hallucinations. I mean, people, uh, straight scientists who write about what they call hallucination are really writing about what is technically called hypnagogia, which means the trivial hallucinations on the edge of sleep, you know, the spinning wheels, the moving grids of color, the dancing mice, that sort of thing. Uh, Psychedelic hallucinations are visionary operas of some sort. I mean, they are tremendous. They're more visually dramatic than any film experience or experience in the real world that you could have. There's no very good explanation for what that's all about. In your trial and error of getting to five grams of mushrooms, um, did you uh, have you have you got ten grams and that was too much, or is it, or have you built up to that and that's that's enough? Ten grams is too much for me. I mean, I people have different reactions to it. I think if it gets un, too un, if the episodes of unEnglish ability are too prolonged then you need to back the dose down, you know, because it just doesn't make any sense. It's also the power of it. I mean, my God, when you overdose on psilocybin, it's like an asteroid struck the planet or something. It's very hard to convince yourself that it's confined between your ears. It's more like, you know, everything from... Las Vegas West just was vaporized. Uh, well, I think we should knock off. You might want to talk about um, the copyright of genetic, copywriting of genetic coding. I don't know if you've heard that Monsanto and DuPont, these, uh, they're getting into agribusiness. They go off to the uh, mountains of the Andes and solicit the indigenous cultures to provide them with their potato stock, then they go back and dissect the genetic code and copyright it. So they happen to catch a farmer in Idaho growing the same potato, they can sue him because they hold the copyright on that code. Well, it, yeah, I mean, this is a very complicated issue. It isn't, nece- it isn't necessarily of interest to this group. It, it's of interest to me because I deal with the question of endangered species and stuff like that. This question of what shall we give the rainforest people for the drugs and medicines that we take out is a real tricky question because say I go to the Amazon and and I bring back a plant and, and I am able to vegetatively propagate this plant into a crop of some sort. Well, now all I took from the Amazon was one plant, which God knows there's plenty of there, but also the knowledge of the people, because inevitably you learn this stuff from informants. There's very little original botanizing of any consequence in the Amazon. But it, the and, and there's been a lot of debate among pharmaceutical companies and conservation organizations as to what should we give back to these cultures. And, of course, pharmaceutical companies think in terms... They will, even the ones that are well-motivated and generous think in terms of money and medicine. Well, money they don't need. Money will destroy the culture. And medicine seems a disingenuous thing to give them since the premise was, in the first place, that their medicine was better than your medicine. Uh, I don't know what should be done about this. I do know in practical terms I have seen whole scenes go to hell over, a, over something as simple as an outboard motor. I mean, an outboard motor brings whores and alcohol days closer to an upriver village. And so what favor are you doing, these people, by dropping a 110-horsepower Evinrude onto the the jefe of the village. Uh, Really, I don't know if there's any... The biggest favor we could do them is to never show up in the first place. Uh, But that would defeat our goal, our goal, meaning the pharmaceutical goal, of extracting drugs from the rainforest, which is not an unnoble goal. I mean, after all, if you're trying to cure AIDS or TB or, or shrink tumors... 
that's not exactly a mission of rape and destruction, but it can turn into rape and destruction depending on how it's prosecuted. Does that... But sometimes the way they're natively prepared. You know, I mean, if you're going to start preparing drugs by extracting uh, supposed active uh, ingredients, then you're losing the synergism, you're losing the life of the, uh, the history that's there, too. Well, yeah, and you're losing a connection to the morphogenetic field, if you believe morphogenetic fields uh, exist. Uh, you're losing the induction ritual that may be connected with the drugs. Mm-hmm. Use oh, oh. That's right. That's right. I mean, but but even on your own terms, you see, you're on your own terms, you're taking away what you need because if you have a materialist view of medicine, then really all you need is the uh, the um, the substance. Well, this is this Sheldrakean idea that things long in existence have a kind of momentum to perpetuate themselves. That things that are very recently uh, created lack. It's not a scientifically um, creditable notion, but Rupert's been working for many years to show that an idea like this is necessary to to solve some of the problems of modern biology. Do you all understand the concept? It's slippery, but fairly simple. It's that it can be simply stated by saying, once something happens it's easier for it to happen again uh, anywhere in the universe. And, and it leads to somewhat magical expectations in the realm of experimentation. In other words, if you, if you design a maze of some sort that has never existed before and you teach rats in Canada to run this maze and they get very good at it, then when you go to Australia to teach rats to run the same maze, they should learn faster. And believe it or not, there is some evidence for this effect. Uh, A very interesting experiment was done a couple of years ago where a computer was programmed with Hebrew, programmed to generate three-letter sequences of Hebrew words, Now, some of these, uh, uh, I'm sorry, three-letter sequences of Hebrew letters, and some of these sequences were Hebrew words, including words which occur in the Torah and consequently are, are read by, have been read by devout Jews since Abraham, and some were simply random combination of Hebrew letters that meant nothing. And then what they did is they went, uh, they, I think, used a Korean population, people who had absolutely no empathy or familiarity with Hebrew, and they would flash these three-letter sequences on a television screen, and you would be asked, A, to guess whether it was a word or nonsense, and then B, you were asked to guess, if you thought it was a word, what the word meant, And then C, you were asked to rate the confidence of your guess between 1 and 10. And and what they discovered was none of these Korean people could guess the meaning of the Hebrew words. But when confronted with a real word in Hebrew, they had high confidence that that was what it was. And so you see, this seems to imply that the Hebrew words that had been said by millions and millions of Jews over time had a field, a morphogenetic field around them that the purely arbitrary stuff didn't. And then other other experiments have been done, you know, with nursery rhymes versus rhymes that were just made up by a poet a week ago. Uh, I actually thought of a experiment which I thought would settle it once and for all because I noticed uh, my publicist, I mean I resist technology, believe it or not, but my publicist finally forced me to get call waiting. Well, so then I noticed that the telephone will be silent for hours. Then it rings. You pick it up, you start talking to somebody and immediately the call waiting thing starts beeping. 
and it, it's clear that a, a telephone call in progress attracts other <laughs> telephone calls. And uh, my, my, well, my notion was you could create a computer system to monitor an office building where hundreds of people were getting calls and making calls and see if, in fact, ordinary statistical expectations are violated because I, I think it's uncanny. I mean, I go away to Esalen on a weekend like this and I will go home and there'll be 30 messages on the phone machine and then when I listen to them, some of them will be no longer than 15 or 20 seconds and I can hear the call waiting on the message machine as the person is leaving the message. So I can't be receiving 3,500 calls a day. So it must be that the act of a, a telephone call in progress is a magnet for another telephone call. That's morphogenetic resonance. Or it, yeah, right. <laughs> Are you going to, um, did you intend to, to discuss your current thinking about the, um, current today about the uh, eschaton philosophy? And, and if you were, what, what I'm really interested in is whether we were talking about everything from Amazon people to, um, you know, this morning our, ourselves and how people relate to the experience. What's the point of it all? If you're still convinced that this is a 20 year cycle before the entire universe that we know, well, I think that uh, if your hypothesis is that a universe of 20 billion y years plus age is about to go bazingo in 20 years, you should probably prepare a fallback position uh, just in case it goes uh, awry. Uh, I, I've sort of talked around this because I didn't know at what point we wanted to really engage it. Because uh, I talked about uh, the condensation of the imagination as a physical object and the philosopher's stone as an attractor for the historical process. Uh, I really, and I talked about this alien force, the tractor beam that reaches into our species and begins sculpting us in its image. And that's where we are now. All of this leads toward the conclusion, I think, that biology is being drawn out of matter and that the, this is not some kind of process that goes on hundreds of thousands or millions of years in the future, that history is actually ending within our lifetime. And I've, you know, I mean, it sounds silly in a way to say it, but based on what will come this evening, maybe not so silly, you can actually calculate the rate of closure. You can actually figure out the kind of acceleration in which we're involved in. And it leads to the conclusion that history has only a very little bit more to run. That's, in a sense, realists know this, but deny the implication I mean, we're running out of everything. That's always a sure sign that the party is over, you know? <laughs> when the liquor's gone, when the hors d'oeuvres are munched, when the buffet table is wreckage, the party is over. It's time to go home, folks. Go get your hats and coats, call your cabs, and uh, do your host a favor. And uh, that's where we are. Uh, it's impossible... It's impossible to imagine history continuing for centuries, and given the rate of acceleration, it doesn't appear that that's going to happen. The only question is, is it extinction? Is, it, is that what it is? Or is it transformation? And I choose to believe it's transformation because the evidence of the psychedelics seems to support that. Um, I can't, I mean, I guess I can't stress enough my sense that history is anomalous, that there's no way to get used to it, and that it represents a phase transition. It's an extraordinary emergency circumstance. It only lasts tops 25,000 years, 
And really, the intense part is the last five or six thousand years. I mean, if you go back six thousand years, we're talking four thousand BC. The pyramids weren't built yet. Uh, nothing familiar was in place in 4000 BC. You know, there's a, a tendency in occult thinking to fiddle with the dating because occultists have inherited without uh, sophisticated examination the Renaissance's belief that the older it is, the better it is. And... Uh, you know, enthusiasts of Atlantis want to place it 50,000 years in the past and Lemuria 100,000 years. This is all nonsense. Uh, the, the miracle of our predicament is not how long everything has been in place, but how brief it all has been. The whole thing has come into being since yesterday. I mean, the people who built the pyramids are what, 1,500 generations in the past? Less, less. Probably more like 600 generations in the past. So the emergence of technology codes, high culture, is all very, very sudden. And uh, this seems to be, I, I think it's a phenomenon which could be elevated to the level of a general rule about reality, that each stage of cosmic development happens much quicker than the stage which preceded it. So after the initial Big Bang, you know, there was a long, long period of basically just churning physical chemistry, uh, not even physical chemistry, but an atomic plasma. There were no elements. There were only electrons. Uh, Later, hydrogen and helium formed and could aggregate into stars. Then a new property (coughs) emerged. In the center of these large masses of helium, fusion began to take place because the pressure and temperature went so high. Well, fusion cooked out heavier elements like iron and carbon And they become the basis then for a whole new kind of reality, molecular existence, and then organomolecular existence based on long-chain polymers, based on carbon. Once life emerged, the tempo really begins to pick up. Change is now coming on a scale of once every few million years. Once you get higher animals change is even more accelerated. Once you have languages and culture, change takes an exponential leap forward. And the main characteristic of our culture is phenomenally accelerated change. So much change that when you take this curve of acceleration and plot its future vector, you discover that within 50 years we will release more energy than there is in the solar system, travel faster than light, so forth and so on. Well, if you assume these things are impossible, then it means we're hitting the limit. We're approaching the limit. Yeah. Um, Can you talk about singularities in relation to your theory? Yeah. Uh, the, The attractor at the end of time is a perfect example of a singularity. And, in fact, good question. Uh, it seems that, first of all, what is a singularity? A singularity is a, is a place where the rules are broken. Uh, a miracle is a singularity. Uh, and it, strangely enough, it turns out to be very hard to model the universe without resorting to a singularity or, or several. A few years ago, uh, Stephen Hawking, who has incredible press, I must say, uh, <laughs> Stephen Hawking uh, 
hypothesized that the existence of what he called mini black holes. He thought that black holes left over from the early birth of the universe had evaporated so much matter off their surfaces that they might be now down to the size of a few centimeters in diameter. Well, when they asked him to calculate how many of these mini black holes there are in the universe, they came up with a number like... uh, uh, 14 high 11. Well, if every one of those black holes has a singularity in the center of it, that's a hell of a lot of singularities. What kind of a theory is it that allows for 14 high 11 exceptions to its rule? That there are exceptions to the rule. Well, that's a fishy way, you know, that's a way of wiggling out of it. Straight science... (laughs) tries to do it with just one singularity. Essentially, the position of ordinary science is give us one free miracle and then we can explain everything. And that one free miracle is uh, the idea that the universe sprang from an area considerably smaller than a gnat's eyebrow uh, for no reason in a single moment. And if you believe that, then all the rest (laughs) flows quite naturally. Notice, however, that whatever you think about this idea, it's the limit case for credulity. Do you understand what I mean? I mean you cannot think of a more unlikely proposition. It's almost like the the unlikeliest of all propositions, I defy anyone to dream up a position less intuitively compelling than that one. And yet that's where they start from, you see. So what I say is, okay, if science gets one free singularity, then, it, then in the game of hypothesis building, it must be that each player is dealt one singularity chip at the beginning. And I choose to play mine at the end and say it's highly unlikely to my mind that a singularity would spring from an absolute nothingness. I mean, that seems to me the least fruitful environment to seek uh, a singularity of this type. Far more likely, if singularities exist at all, that they would exist in a domain of complex energies, molecular bonds, chemical bonds, electromagnetic radiation, hard radiation, languages, biological systems, membranes, gels, liquid crystals, and so forth. In other words, the kind of stew of phenomena that our present cosmos represents, who can say what could arise out of this? I mean, if you can get people... You could get anything, uh, it seems to me. So rather than view the universe as the shock wave of an initial explosion spreading out through the dimensions, why not place the singularity as a chaotic attractor at the end of the life of the universe and see all processes as drawn toward it rather than pushed away from it, drawn toward it, complexified, interleaved, folded, mixed, and connected in many, many exotic ways. And that's what this eschaton object is. I mean, it's something which we anticipate through technology. It's something we are building out of ourselves, you know, the, the grand work of history is the condensation and concrescence of the visible soul. But in the same way that alchemists are like catalysts to natural processes, that was the idea, see, that gold and precious metals grew in the earth and that alchemists were not doing anything unnatural. They were simply really speeding up time. Well, in that same way, What we are doing is uh, catalyzing the emergence of a process that nature would otherwise ultimately deliver at some yet more distant time. We're like an enzyme in the universal 
mix of being. And what the eschaton is, is pointless to speculate upon because it is literally below the event horizon of rational apprehendability. That means we're too stupid to know what it is. But when we look east, the sky is touched with the rosy blush of dawn. But the surface of the solar disk of the singularity has not yet come above the horizon. However, in the next 20 years, I think this will happen. I mean, I will abandon this theory long before we reach 2012 if it doesn't <coughs> begin to gain power as a meme in society. Because one of the things the mushroom told me that I found to be true, it's an interesting it said to me, nothing is unannounced. You know, there is no such thing as a surprise. Everything is preceded by the ghost of its appearance. And if you're sensitive to that, you know, you can't be taken by surprise. That's part of the nature of a fractal cosmos, is that nothing is utterly unannounced. How could it be, since everything is uh, distributed through the matrix? So you're saying this is a different notion than history? I mean, you're describing history from this very beginning? or, or Yeah, that history is in a series of approximations of the final singularity. And that's what all these religions are. They're people's best guess, given their cultural circumstance and historical angle of regarding, their best guess as to what the singularity is. Yeah. Um, Mayan calendrics, how about, how did they um, arrive at uh, the end date in their calendar at the same time? Well, the only thing I share in common with the Maya is that we both did mushrooms. So it's sort of like, is it that there's a barcode in there <laughs> that no matter where and when in all of space and time you take the mushroom, you come to the conclusion that something very important is going to happen on December 22nd, 2012. The Mayan calendar is a real puzzle, uh, not the well-known details of it, although to speak of any detail of the Mayan calendar as well-known is maybe uh, specious. But, see, the, the strange thing about the Mayan calendar... It's about a 4,385-year, or 5,485-year cycle with many sub-cycles in it. It begins on a slow Tuesday in August, and it ends on a winter solstice, uh, a, a very important winter solstice. Uh, a winter solstice when the heliacal rising of the sun is eclipsing the galactic center. That seems to imply that the Mayans, that the Maya did not establish the beginning of their calendar and count forward. They established the end date and counted backward to establish the beginning. And uh, there's argument among astronomers as to whether this is even possible for people at that level of culture to do. You know, there are a number of these astronomical mysteries around, like the Dogon tribe in, in Africa, who, before the era of telescopes, cheerfully informed astronomers that the star Sirius, which is ten light years away, had a companion too faint to be seen by the naked eye and that it had a 50-year orbit around Sirius Prime. This is true. How did they know that? Uh, and they go further. They also claim a third companion, Sirius C, which has to this day not yet been detected. If it is detected by long base interferometry or some other, that speckling technique, well, if, they, if Sirius C comes into focus, a lot of people will have to come to terms with the question of how did the Dogon get this. <laughs> However, there are, there are odd examples of unbelievably 
what appear to be unbelievably unlikely coincidences or good guesses. For example, uh, um, Jonathan Swift wrote Gulliver's Travels, and he describes in there uh, the presence of two moons around Mars and their relative size and orbital periods 70 years before William Herschel observed these objects through the telescope. And nobody knows, you know, was it just an incredibly lucky guess? Or, or what was going on there? Yeah. Uh, likewise, on the Yi Ching, do you think that was put together by some incredibly smart Chinese, or was it revealed somehow to them? No, I think it, I, I, I tend to be nervous about the extraterrestrial hypothesis because I think, I believe in extraterrestrials, but I believe that real extraterrestrials are so peculiar that, that, the job is to recognize them, you know. No, I think that uh, <clears throat> not the Chinese, because the evidence seems to point to the fact that the I Ching was actually composed in central southern China somewhere by a pre Zhou people. But I think that these people had a technique perhaps analogous to a yogic technique, perhaps analogous to the stilling of the heart techniques, which are yogas that suppress physiological functioning, and that they were, they were able to look into organism, and they're looking into their own bodies with a completely different epistemic toolkit than we have. They saw flux, and they watched perhaps for a thousand years, you know, and tried to model this flux. And they finally realized that, that there were myriads of elements in this flux, but not an infinite number of elements. And that all of the structure of the flux could in fact be reduced to 64 elements which they then created a symbolical notation system for, which we call hexagrams. In other words, in the same way that we, with our obsession with matter, have discovered and satisfied ourselves that it only requires, what is it now, 108 elements to create all material phenomena and all molecular configurations, they discovered that there are 64 elements necessary to produce all varieties of temporal situation. There is a, it is no coincidence that the numbers which run the I Ching, 64, 6, 4, cube of 8, so forth and so on, that all of those numbers are the same numbers that are necessary to describe the functioning of DNA. Uh, I mean, the, the, you can perfectly model the DNA using the I Ching. Not only the 64 codons that code for protein, but templating, replication, so forth and so on. All the functions of DNA can be modeled very cleanly using the I Ching. So really what it is, is it's a calculus of biological uh, necessity. And we, as creatures made of DNA, then find that this calculus of biological necessity functions for us like magic because uh, it describes the matrix in which we are, in fact, embedded and, and, and with which we must come to terms. That's why throwing the I Ching, you know, even though I think that's a, com a completely corrupted use of it. Still, it is like dropping a dipstick into the flow of a river and then pulling it out and taking a depth measurement. Uh, it's something like that. Yeah. Actually, uh, Ascaton, um, I was wondering if, if some of the things we're seeing manifest now are perhaps reverberations of this event which is approaching. And I was wondering if, if crop circles might fit into that somehow. Well, I think that, well, when pressed, I guess, I think that all phenomena are reverberations and, and in a sense, pre-echoes 
is that a preco? I'm not sure. Of the the eschaton, the eschaton. I mean, you've, many of you have heard me make this metaphor. It's like one of those mirrored bar balls in a disco. It is. It reflects its in its surround. The essence of the eschaton is impossible to discern because its surface is mirrored. So when you look at the eschaton, what you see, strangely enough, is your own face. And uh, religions and hysterias of various sorts are particularly strong incidences of reflection of the eschaton. This thing which happened in Waco, Texas, was just fascinating because it, it was a real cognitive dissonance. It, it made no sense to most people. And yet, obviously, to the people inside the metaphor, it made perfect sense. I think we will see more and more of this kind of thing and that, in fact, we need to guard against it. Uh, prophets of all sorts will arise in the last days. Christianity taught this in an attempt to cover its own ass, not realizing that it is one of these cults which arise in the last days. The whole thing about the Christos, stripped of all the mumbo-jumbo, what this is about is uh, the mystery of the resurrection. The idea that Christ was somehow involved in some kind of crypto-biological transformation that was necessary in order to unlock the doors of paradise which had been slammed shut with the fall of Adam. And I, I find Christianity fascinating. I, I don't believe a word of it because I don't think Christian theologians understand what they're looking at. But what they're looking at is um, the closest thing to the eschaton that we ever had. But the conclusions are all wrong. Uh, there's an amazing passage in, uh, I think it's Luke. It's the morning after the, um, the uh, entombment of Christ and the three Marys Mary, the mother of James, Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of Christ, go to uh, the tomb, and uh, Christ is there, standing beside the rolled-away stone. And, and uh, one of these women starts toward him, and he says, go read it, it's right there, he says, touch me not, woman, for I am not yet fully of the nature of the Father. Well, you just wonder what in the world is going on here. He is alive. He is resurrected. He, is, he has overcome death. But he says, touch me not. I am not yet fully of the nature of the Father. And what it implies is a process of some sort. Something is happening. He is hypercarbolating, uh, is what is happening. And the hypercarbolation is not yet complete. Uh, it was a near miss. And if you read the whole thing from that light, uh, it's clear that the people involved could not understand what was happening. So the picture, what you, what you get here is a picture of somebody not fully in command of their own uh, mojo, you know, and uh, and not themselves completely understanding what is going on. And I think that every religious teacher is a sense a victim of eschatonic precursive reflectivity. Uh, and a David Korish, it's it's a it's a mess. It's a very distorted and twisted kind of reflection. Uh, a Christ, a Buddha, a Mohammed, uh, a slightly cleaner uh, shot at what it is, but nevertheless horribly distorted and misunderstood by historical contextuality. Yeah. I, I was wondering if the study of, of some of the phenomena happening in the, in the uh, crop fields in England might 
shed some light on the form and shape of the eschaton? Well, I think that there that there will be more and more of these anomalies. The flying saucer is an interesting anomaly. The flying saucer is clearly the ghost of the eschaton. It's, uh, I mean, our unconscious mind, the skies of this planet are haunted by the image of a spinning silvery disk that has eternity and the aliens and the mysteries of existence locked inside of it. Uh, the appearance of the fly.